All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining this RDI Worldwide webinar. For those of you who don't know, I am Gordon Dudley, the CEO of RDI Worldwide, and a very warm welcome to everybody joining us. It's uh, 4 p.m. here in Seoul, and uh, it's 8 a.m. in the UK. Uh, I know that we have a number of time zones uh, on this session, so welcome to everybody. If it's uh, the morning time for you, then grab your coffees. If it's the afternoon time, then perhaps the second or third cup of the day. So uh, again, welcome to uh, everybody. Uh, today's session is going to be on the on the talent on the subject of talent intelligence, uh, and we have a fantastic guest speaker who I'm going to introduce for you uh, in a little moment. And uh, first of all, for those of you who maybe have recently got in contact with us, or those of you who have not had any direct contact with, with RDI in the past. I want to just give you a little bit of uh, introductions to who we are and what we are uh, and why we are doing what we're doing. So really, uh, this subject of talent intelligence is, is very much uh, in our ethos. Uh, we are a, a company established uh, in the UK originally in 1996 and here in Korea uh, in our Seoul branch just a little bit over four years ago. Um, if we talk about why we, we do what we do, then we're coming at, uh, at things with a concept that uh, work doesn't always have to feel like hard work. So if you think about uh, this kind of concept that if your uh, company was be able to create a culture that feels like work doesn't feel like hard work, then perhaps uh, then we could make everybody uh, be more happy uh, at work, more engaged at work, and ultimately uh, perform better. So what we're all about is people. And so that's what we bring is a real uh, passion for people um, in everything that we do uh, internally for us as, uh, as a team and, and a company uh, operating with, with our clients uh, and also uh, through our services. So the three things that we mostly do are uh, there for you. Uh, the performance management is an area where we are helping to, uh, companies to, to drive uh, better results. We also do leadership development, whether that's uh, somebody as a first-time leader uh, or somebody who's very experienced uh, at the sea level, uh, driving an entire organization, managing others who are managing people. And we have programs uh, that uh, cover all of that. Lastly, we also do talent acquisition. And this is, of course, a very important part of uh, people management. And that's where we're trying to cover, uh, in some sense, the entire employee life cycle in what we do through talent acquisition, finding the right people uh, for the right job in uh, a wide range of industries uh, here, uh, both in and uh, across Asia and uh, around the world where we help our clients keeping in mind the entire time that, uh, that passion about people that we, that we drive. So that's a little bit about us, and I hope that uh, today will uh, be thought-provoking uh, as well as in insightful, whether you are a, uh, a CEO uh, or someone in HR, uh, somebody who, who's simply interested in, in what this uh, subject is all about. Uh, fundamentally, uh, everybody comes into contact with, with people in their work, and relationships and how we interact with one another is really the, one of the key differentiating factors. So in this session, um, some contact uh, for you are, uh, perhaps at the end as well. And now I'd like to introduce our uh, guest speaker for this session. And I'm very happy to welcome uh, Jeanette Bodkin, uh, who is based in the UK. Uh, she is uh, an expert in uh, all things uh, to do with talent management. And today she's going to be giving us a, a little kind of introduction and insight into what is talent intelligence. In some sense, how to get ahead of the curve. Uh, most people have been familiar with, uh, with headhunting and uh, regular recruiting as a service for, for a few decades now. But if you really want to uh, beat the competition, you have to get ahead of the curve. And this is what uh, in talent, talent intelligence is really all about. So we're going to be having a presentation uh, from her, following which we will have a Q&A. So please do submit your questions uh, throughout the session and uh, we'll take them uh, from, from there. 
So without uh, further ado, uh, I'd like to hand over to Jeanette. Hello, hello everybody. So here I'm going to be talking about talent intelligence and in particular the um, qualitative aspects or the conversation based talent intelligence. That's more of my background, uh, but absolutely um, talent intelligence does encompass both the, the, the data, uh, the secondary data and primary data um, and, and um, I absolutely have background in, in, in those areas with a bias to uh, the qualitative side. Um, so the talents intelligence we're referring to here because the term is talked about a lot and there's a lot of fluidity about this term. There are companies who call it different things like talent insight, for instance. Um, there are suppliers to HR teams who will just simply mirror the language back um, to, uh, to, to, to HR uh, using their language and then produce um, a, a study or an output using their terms that might be market insight for instance but here we are talking about talent intelligence that leads to um, talent acquisition executive recruitment or, or niche recruitment so largely um, or in the main probably a hundred percent relating to the acquisition of passive candidates so what we'll be running through this morning and this is me <laughs> um, so this is me um, and I was about to say that um, talent intelligence is often delivered by people with a search consultancy background or, or headhunters um, I have had um, um, I spent quite a while with Armstrong Craven um, a European supplier for for talent intelligence um, and also uh, services like talent pipelining um, and I've supplied such studies to the likes of Facebook, Microsoft um, a number of others mainly large corporations but also um, smaller businesses too. So here we are um, I'll explain this, uh, this, this image so to, to define first of all talent intelligence um, one definition is the gathering and subsequent analysis of external labour data in order to inform talent strategies and, and tactics. Um, that is one definition. Um, it has, it, that's quite a recent definition, actually. Uh, but as mentioned, there's a lot of fluidity. There's, it, it has a, talent intelligence has a background in talent analytics um, and in, in executive research. Two very, very different areas. Um, and if you think about it, two very different groups of people. So sometimes you, you may have analytics people in uh, people or talent analytics people in large corporations. HR people here may, may have those staff members. Um, they tend to be, or well, this might be a stereotype, they tend to be quite desk orientated, looking at statistics, uh, looking at LinkedIn data, for instance, not really having conversations. And then you also have executive research now executive research is is basically what we had before talent intelligence um talent intelligence is <clears throat> excuse me a type of executive research so that's this whole idea of conversations um in order to uh, deliver uh, talent intelligence in order to deliver talent acquisition services or uh, due diligence around people but that right now we're at a really exciting transitional phase hence the image of Archaeopteryx the dinosaur bird <laughs> we're at a really exciting transitional phase where um, those two areas are coming together uh, and um, we can see this in the likes of SAP the large German, German software corporation, Facebook, Google. Facebook and Google, especially Facebook, they are investing kind of in a second generation now of talent intelligence teams and, and putting more senior people um, into those roles as, as it becomes more important. And of course, it's becoming more important because you know there's so much more data. And also from a social point of view, people are much more open to, to sharing data. Um, about themselves and, and sharing uh, their, their, their background and sharing their ambitions. Um, in my view, they've always been open to those types of conversations, um, but now it's, it's more obvious. So here we are. Um, this is ultimately about combining those two areas, um, combining that data with 
emotional intelligence, life intelligence, IQ, you know, thinking about what a headhunter, a sector specialist headhunter might have in mind, um, and, and ultimately leading to superior talent acquisition, executive recruitment, because um, an outcome of talent intelligence, the core outcome is um, a lower cost per hire um, and a higher quality per hire. Um, and, and, I can, and I can explain how and why that is. So what is talent intelligence? In what situation should you be using it? So starting at the bottom here, we have executive recruitment. If you have a recruitment need, now you need recruitment. You, you don't need talent intelligence. You, you just need to get that person in if you need to get that person in. So, but thinking um, about um, in the nearer term, in the medium term, if you think about um, say six months, 12 months from now, you might have a view of uh, a certain leader you need to bring in. It's a type of leader you've brought in before. You're probably going to use the same job description. You're probably going to um, uh, source from the same areas. That's talent pipelining. Now, if you are further ahead from that big appointment, say a year, 18 months, two years, um, now we're talking about talent intelligence because talent intelligence informs the eventual recruitment strategy. Um, and it's usually used for uh, 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 eventual appointments. It could be one appointment or a group of appointments or a group of appointments relating to a new location, for instance, because an enterprise is doing something really quite different than it's done in the past and it needs very different people or, or very different individual leaders, it might be even culturally different. So it's a, a recruitment situation that's in the future where an awful lot of thought needs to take place beforehand and talent intelligence as an approach offers a structure for that. So project triggers. Here we have on the left um, in grey, the project triggers where uh, it's, bit, it's a bit more operational, I would say. So uh, succession, um, so looking at, you know, Prince Charles and, and Elizabeth II there, um, you know, even in enterprises where HR leaders don't have sight of the strategy because you're just firefighting. Of course, even, even in those cases, you know that eventually your lead, some leaders you know, may retire and, and people will move up and that, that will, you know, backfilling will be required. So that's a, that's a trigger. But it really in particularly where you think that it's going to be a very different leader um, than what you appoint normally, or there's a very critical situation and you, you have to absolutely make sure you get the best or the best that your enterprise, the best talent that your enterprise can acquire. So next to that, we have the globe and um, a country icon. Um, and um, this is referring to uh, location. Um, it's, for example, there are corporations which are shifting from being manufacturers to technology. And that means that the new sites that they're opening up are in very different locations. Um, they are uh, fishing from pools from a talent perspective, which, which are pretty crowded. So, uh, so for example, I, kn I know of a very large enterprise where their talent intelligence teams do, do, do multiple location studies and looking at the types of leaders and the types of technology staff members that, that are available. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes the conclusions are not to go to the obvious places, for instance. Um, the next to this, we have the shark. So that's mergers and acquisitions. And again, that relates to succession. Of course, later on, a, an enterprise would want to put their own leader at the top of a, an acquired business. And, and that leads to, to, to backfilling. Um, and then here below, we've got the arrow. So that's referring to uh, um, the, the life cycle. So say a sales life cycle in a, in a slower moving sector, say aerospace, it, it might be um, quite clear that um, you know, 18 months, two years from now, you're going to need a new sales leader. But given where you are in that life cycle, we're thinking that we might need someone quite different than, than what we appoint normally. Or it may even be, in some cases, a completely different job title. So, sorry, going off on a little tangent here, um, you know, should we be appointing another sales director? Or actually, nowadays, should actually, shouldn't that be a digital customer experience person, perhaps? Or, you know, or, or a different type of, you know, even a different type of job description. 
Um, next to the arrows in the circles here, we have a, a gavel and a document. So that's referring to external factors such as new legislation. Um, so for example, GDPR in Europe, obvious example right now is COVID-19 and social distancing um, and all kinds of possible legislation that will come up and rules. Um, and I know this is already in place in, in many Asian countries, we're a bit behind in Europe, um, but there's all kinds of rules now, obviously all kinds of rules, and that might mean slightly different leaders coming into the business in certain operational areas. Um, so more to the right here, we've got the icons in maroon. Um, so first of all, at the top here, um, that is not food, that, that circle is, is a petri dish, so that's talking about experimentation. Um, it may be that um, in the, the thinking about a, you know, a three-year strategic plan, a very, very, you know, very different leaders might come in, maybe even from a completely different sector, and you're just not sure whether that's going to be a good idea to bring in those people from that very different cultural um, background, intellectual background even. Um, so, for example, uh, I worked for a, a major technology enterprise on the B2B side who a couple of years ago recognized that uh, more advanced, um, more advanced uh, customer experience was, was seen on the consumer side. Um, and, they, and they wanted to bring in leaders from the consumer side to kind of inject that, that enhanced customer experience into their B2B setting. So they were looking at people from Nike. They, they were potentially, no, they were brainstorming about people from Nike, uh, people from you know, the, the, big, the big consumer companies, Warner Brothers, um, and Adidas, the, uh, even some of the, 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 the major supermarkets in Europe. And, and um, they were, and a, a talent intelligence study was, was delivered to them that helped them explore the skill sets these people have, whether they'd be open to a B2B background, how they would expect to be attracted, what was important to them. And so that would get them in a position where they could think to themselves, look, should we do this? Should we take this big leap and invest, from, invest in someone from a completely different sector? Um, and if so, which of those multiple consumer sectors? So that talent intelligence project answered that question. Um, uh, next to the, that circle um, is the, the strategy um, icon, and, and, and yes, there, that, that's kind of saying a similar thing. Um, that the, the next wave of strategy might be quite different to this one, that might mean different leaders. It also might mean certain other questions that are raised around, you know, how do we, sh you know, the, the organizational chart, who these people should be reporting to. Um, if we're going to be doing something quite different strategically, that obviously has other knock-on effects. And when it comes to, to people, it raises other questions. And of course, um, in, in, with talent uh, intelligence and, and in the, especially the interview based talent intelligence, you, know, you, can, you have an opportunity to ask people directly, you know, who do you think you should be reporting to? Wh which of the board members should you even be reporting direct to the board if, if you were to carry out this role in, 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 in such an organisation? And people are very open, actually, to sharing that kind of helpful information. Um, underneath here, at the bottom, we have evolution. Um, so that's referring to a trigger where... Um, you know, next generation type leaders. Uh, sales is a, is a classic example. Marketing is a great example as well, where I can imagine marketing directors in, in five years time will be really different from marketing directors today, just, just given, given the changes that, that, that have taken place, thinking in the digital sphere. Um, so that's exploring, you know, do we, um, in enterprise exploring, do, do we, what, what kind of people do we bring in next? And actually you know are they ready because they're probably going to be younger um you know thinking about digital natives uh, you know thinking about people who've always you know worked on cloud products for example but are they actually probably too early career right now for us to bring them in do we need do we need do they need to have certain career experiences you know who, who are who are the stronger of that, that kind of cohort and what kind of experiences do they have? Would they be interested in us? Should we be interested in them? So talent intelligence answers, answers those kind of questions. And, and, and the, the, the objective is, you know, so you, when you do get to that point, you know, 18 months down the line, two years down the line, and you start that recruitment project, you invest in that headhunt. Um, and of course, headhunts can be expensive. You get in a position where you must, you're, you're more likely to be right first time in terms of the sectors that you're targeting. 
or if you're not successful first time if your plan a is not successful you already have a, a plan b part prepared you know a, you know another set of sectors a, a a tier two type of candidate that persona that you might be looking at so it, that's the idea of of how it you know you know you get to excellence and you are very smart with your costs and your resources so moving on here to questions and answers so this is kind of summarizing some of the things I've, I've just said with the with the previous slide um, so on the left hand side here we have um, we have HR and talent so this is the, the main consumers of talent intelligence are HR and talents and then they would tend to um, share that on with the business share some insights with the wider business but these questions here are the bread and butter these are the kind of questions in many of the talent intelligence uh, assignments that I've worked on th these are the questions that that, that are being answered and um, in the middle here the middle column for, for you know the on the operational side the business side probably better to say and um, there's often a smattering of these questions um, so for example uh, which te what technology what platforms are proving successful so taking example for, for the travel sector for instance which was a, a sector that I worked for um, they want the there the they were all shifting to new technologies there were lots of less visible suppliers of that technology of those technologies um, the travel sector was heavily diversifying so my client wanted to know what what technology platforms they were using um, in the course of the research we realized that that's not enough just to answer that question and we could find out why they were using certain technology platforms and that was really important because every business is different what's successful in one business is not going to be successful in another so that wider context was really um quite quite was really appreciated um and and it was even remarked that we we went further in that talent intelligence project than the management consultants had done we'd, we'd got because of the intimacy because of the, the the close conversations we were having because of the information the respondents were sharing we went further than the the management consultants in some areas um now the the reason why we we're getting that information is you know is we're having career conversations we're headhunters but we're not asking them about something they're either interested in or not interested in or trying to persuade them into something that we think they should be interested in this is all about the respondent this is asking them well what are you leading um how do you feel about um the the mandate that you have the tools that you have for example the technology and people can be really open to this because they're often not asked how they're felt they're they're expected to do they're expected to strategize and own that strategy and you know show that responsibility but they're rarely asked how they feel um, and so this is where we come to the the column on the on the far right hand side for strategy now to be honest this isn't the main objective of talent intelligence we're not aiming to answer these questions you know in terms of the top of the list these are the very solid secondary benefits i would say but in my experience i have consistently come up with these um with insights in these areas because these leaders and it's often leaders that we're, we're interviewing or we're, we're having career conversations with they, they are executing on a strategy um, that strategy is often imperfect they they're very keen to share their opinions on that they have opinions on how, how that strategy should be peaked, uh, tweaked they're very keen that you know that they, they actually like the opportunity to, to to share their views their expert views on on, on matters um, like that um, so you start to see how you can as a secondary benefit share with your client you know the then the, what we think the next wave of, of a certain strategy might look like for example in uh, in customer experience um, and it could even be in really dry areas like where we will build our our, our, our our next supermarkets for instance what you know will what kind of um digital experience would be included there um so so the, the these secondary benefits are really appreciated by the wider business. And of course, if HR is owning that project, 
um, you know, and, and there, you know, it could be HR people conducting the project. More often than not, it's, it has been suppliers conducting these projects and they're bringing that back into the business. That positions HR as, as really quite, as, as quite strategic um, and as a font of knowledge that, that might not have been expected. Um, and it, it gives HR an opportunity to really lead in people matters, you know, and even beyond. So, um, how it's done. I'm going to have to let me have a drink here. I've already alluded to this. Um, these are targeted conversations, often conducted by headhunters, um, who are sector experts with um, a group of people which will have commonalities. So, for example, marketing directors in Thailand in the retail sector um, at a certain level hierarch hierarchically, and I've men I mentioned say directors, um, and they might be in a certain, even a certain type of, 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 of size of business. So you might want to take the, 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 the biggest, for example, the largest companies in that sector. You, you can see here, once you get to say 10 conversations, 15 conversations, um, which is a typical sample, it can be more, then you start to have themes on um you know on, on on from from the questions that you're asking and you can start to um you, you can start to draw out themes and insights and, and even conclusions that, that solidly answer the questions that your 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 clients might have um so how it's done it, it, it is those targeted conversations um and me obviously by somebody who already is quite familiar with the sector and they can start to analyze they can start to draw out commonalities they can also start to spot anomalies and investigate those anomalies um you know having someone who is already familiar with that sector can and very familiar with having these types of conversations they can start to interrogate well why are you saying that that's quite different from from, from your peers um and, and you start to to get start to get competitive intelligence in some cases um, start to spot the the more thoughtful leaders who are you know almost maybe being quite visionary or thinking ahead of other people and that's really rich information um, for for business leaders who are looking for their you know their successors or, or looking for for a, a key senior manager for instance um, and I've mentioned here um, you know moments full of meaning these are quite VIP conversations. These are conversations led by someone with a high degree of credibility who is confident in speaking with senior leaders. Um, it's treating these leaders in a way um, that, 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 they, that they really appreciate in terms of their opinions, in terms of opening things up, in terms of asking what would be an ideal um, next, next role, next position for you as a leader, instead of kind of narrowing them down into um, a specific open position. Um, I would also add here that obviously conversation is coupled with other, other secondary data that might be data from LinkedIn, it might be press data, um, what, what, whatever is kind of, you know, the, the brief requires, um, you know, often for Western companies, for instance, um, some of the smaller countries, some of the emerging markets, they're just they're, they're they're quite invisible to them of course we're we're all in our bubbles with the, you know us westerners will see the western press and even narrower than that uk orientated or french orientated so you know that's kind of sector data even economic data from from a certain country and a certain sector in that country can be greatly appreciated and it can form a very solid backdrop uh, to those to those targeted conversations and all that kind of data can can be brought together also as well um there is uh, you know multiple as I mentioned with analytics there's, there's multiple suppliers who are supplying statistical information now but all data is imperfect and uh, and of course that conversational data can can confirm um you know the the, the validity of, of that data you know of, of you know some statistics from 2018 pre-coronavirus um and you can start to get a sense actually is that is that statistical data still accurate you know in some cases it, it might still be or in some cases you might need to look at it in a slightly different way um those conversations with people in the here and now um can, can be really valid in, in in that sense in in confirming what might be you know already known 
So the output. So here are some real life examples from, from reports that I've done recently. Um, so you can see on the, the so just to summarize actually here, um, the output does tend to be a report with conclusions and you know an executive summary with conclusions, um, you know, recommendations based on the aggregated evidence. Um, and then getting into detail around that evidence, you know, graphs, um, direct quotes, um, you know, some standout statistics. So looking here on the far left, you know, we've got those themes and then the next slide, you know, you can see what's important there. Um, that was actually talking about um, uh, compensation and benefits. In that case, we found out that the sales cohort were, were very, were actually quite happy when it came to the amount they were paid. But what they were really concerned about in this digital digitalizing age is how fair the pay structure was in terms of, you know, working out bonuses. And that was really interesting for the client. You know, that of all the things, you know, company cars, actually, they didn't care. Well, they did care. They expected them. But what they were really bothered about was fairness. Um, perceptions here, you can see um, some quotes talking about the competitors as well. That's interesting. Sometimes the, the gossipy elements <laughs> of these reports can really delight end clients. Um, and then here we've got uh, two questions, the key role attractors, what does the recruitment pitch need to mention? So in this case, we were briefed to find out what's really important to sales candidates. Um, it was in Switzerland, in Austria, in Germany. Um, what's really interesting here is that the Germans, the Swiss um, and the Austrians actually said slightly different things. Um, there were commonalities, but they did say slightly different things. Um, and what we, because we knew that our end client was going to do the headhunt themselves, um, we actually threw in, we added in, the question, you know, what does a recruitment pitch need to mention? What we know what's important to you, but what do you, what does somebody, a stranger, need to talk to you about you, talk to you about right at the beginning stage? What do you need to hear about to make you interested? And that's interesting because they said slightly different things there, and it's different from the kind of importance list. There are similarities, but there are differences too. So that's really powerful for um, a recruitment sales pitch, and it also. Um, puts our client in a position where they have HR generalists, but they can now act like pretty powerful headhunters. Um, and think about the costs that saves too. Okay, um, so here, listing the benefits of an, of an individual project. A Venn diagram. So there are certain, you can see the relationships there that are going on, the, the interaction. Um, so we start off with HR. I keep mentioning cost per hire, quality per hire. That's the end goal here. Um, full ownership of data. The reason why the cost tends to be lower is because this is a research project as opposed to a headhunt. Headhunting is expensive. You know, big, big fees. They might leave after seven months and, you know, you, you don't, there's not much recourse. <laughs> but this is full ownership of, of, of the data. Um, so, you know, obviously with a headhunt, you just see the, 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 the shortlist, but obviously you can do things with this data. Um, there might be, it might be that the approach has been combined with a talent pipelining uh, approach and you have, you know, you have as, as, as an output, a list of names and contact details. Um, and, or it might be there's a secondary benefit of that. We do ask interviewees if they're happy to share their details and more often than not, they say yes. So we're, you know, speaking to the Europeans, we're, we're, we're completely, uh, we can be clear and, and confident with GDPR there. Um, we, you can access a set of recruitment tools as, as, as alluded to earlier, um, you know, thinking about the tools that, um, thinking about the head HR teams doing the headhunt themselves, thinking about the different graphs, thinking about um, the, 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 you have means there to communicate to the wider business um, on some of the challenges and you've got the evidence there. Um, that even in some cases might be statistical if that's been asked for. Um, so looking at, just moving up and looking at the Venn diagram and where it crosses over into the business unit, you know, I've mentioned the ability to acquire talent correctly first time, but also um, a shared understanding of talent opportunities and, and challenges. If the, the, there is 
um, for optimal talent intelligence, there is a need for the business unit to be involved at, at, at the start. Um, so that's a big ask in terms of kind of getting their time and attention, but it does mean that HR and the business unit are on the same page right from the beginning when it comes to something quite challenging. And that obviously has, has great benefits um, for, for that HR function. It's really helpful to them. Um, moving on to the interviewees, um, when we approach these interviewees, um, and you know, to be honest, the majority do, um, I would say the majority, a, a decent amount, over half, just over half do agree to speak. And um, we're offering them the opportunity to learn about something that they've never really thought of before, um, a career pathway. Um, a type of role and that is that approach is heavily curated um, it is conducted by a headhunter who can easily have a very very salesy hat on if they need to uh, but they don't really hear it's much more gentle it's much more soft touch and it's been heavily curated you know we've thought about the sector they're in we've thought about the you know we've seen on LinkedIn or through a different source maybe in the press what they've done, you know, the kind of aspirations we think they might have. And we're, we're coupling that with what our client is talking about. It's a very different world, but I want to guide you through that. You know, that's very VIP. The interviewees love that. They do. Um, and um, even if the client is somebody who they may have not thought of before, it might be a business that is kind of tier two or tier three. Um, you might be a HR leader of that type of business, but because you might be look, being honest about where you need to improve, ambitious about improvement, people can be really open to that. And you might have somebody who is um, at Microsoft, at Google, who, you know, they might be in a more junior position, but they're saying, well, you know, I actually want to, to, to join. I think I quite like the idea of joining a company that might face challenges, especially if they're honest about them. You know, I want to talk to you. I'd be open to speaking to them. I'd be happy to share, um, happy to share my details. Um, so you can see here how we're offering them, a fa you know, an, an opportunity to be bold. We're offering every party here uh, an opportunity to be a bit bolder and providing a structure to do that. Um, so moving on here, longer term, say multiple projects have taken place in, in, in uh, relating to talent intelligence. Um, so for business units, even if, you know, you have a business unit leader or a functional leader like an FD, um, they, if they, even if they've only had sight of a couple of executive summaries and a couple of snap analysis and you know a couple of graphs three or four graphs they actually through that very very curated data have a a much more robust understanding of what's going on externally versus their peers in other companies you know that that's a that, that's a longer term you know a longer term benefit and then we can move on there um, you know, if they've really got either if they if if they've really been working with HR on this um, and had a, a you know even a couple of coffee chats, they've got a firmer understanding of the um, you know the the, the the people related opportunities and threats. Um, but on the HR side, longer term, there's there's an opportunity here to be seen as a more strategic function. HR does have a reputation, even very solid HR teams have a reputation for being quite transactional when looked at by the business. You know, there's, a, there's an opportunity here to, 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 to kind of tweak that view, to, to show your colors in, in, in slightly different ways. Um, and also, of course, as well, you know, that, 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 wide, that, that uh, wider overview of, of talent strengths, weaknesses versus competitors. And of course, these reports, um, these insights can be used in other, you know, applied to other areas. So if you think about sales, say if a, a, a big, a, a significant study was done uh, in, a, in a few countries in a region in sales, well, some of those insights would probably be quite applicable to marketing as well. And it gets you in a stronger position where, you know, when you're speaking with that marketing director, you can point to that information um, and, and, and it's quite credible because of the way that it's been done. So getting towards the end here moving forward talent intelligence is about solving problems 
a challenge to get started is identifying those problems to solve. Um, I've been in, I, in conversations, it has been expressed to me that HR teams do need to be in a position where they're already quite trusted to do something like talent intelligence. Um, that might be because of transactional work. You know, they might have been just very, very solid with that recruitment. Um, but, you know, a degree of trust and a good relationship is required with key business leaders um, to, to get started. And that, but that might be quite informal. That might be, say, through coffee chats. Um, that might be partly, you know, HR getting their credibility up by making sure they have a solid grip of the internal people data first um, and curating that for the, uh, for the business and, and starting conversations based on that. I've mentioned coaching conversations here, which I think is quite important because I have witnessed HR VPs and HRDs have very effective conversations with business unit leaders um, about talent intelligence or leading to talent intelligence using coaching language. Um, suggestions to accelerate. So this is what I've heard from HR leaders and what they're hoping to do longer term through talent intelligence. And that is partnership with workforce planning, um, embedding talent intelligence as a go-to tool. So key people in HR know about it and have a familiarity with it. Um, and I would go and I would being very ambitious, I would go as far to say that I think um, business leaders who are change agents or who are often in change type roles, um, say, you know, thinking about sales today, thinking about marketing, um, thinking about uh, thinking about um, digital transformation, um, that they are have some awareness that, that this exists. Probably, you know, a HR director would help them have that awareness. But I think that they should have this awareness um, that they can, uh, you know, they can recruit, they can, they can um, put together recruitment strategies that dovetail with their own uh, change strategies um, and, and lead to, you know, robust outcomes where every option, you know, multiple options have been considered and, and they get it right first time when it comes to that, uh, when, when they eventually start recruiting for that, for, for that change, for that leader who is also going to be delivering change, for instance. Change is, is a very big trigger um, for, is a major trigger for, for talent intelligence, as, as you would expect. So we've come to the end here. Um, I think Gordon, I think you're going, and Eric, or Eric, I think you're going to be helping me uh, with these questions and, and sharing some of the, the thoughts that have been shared, uh, some, of the, some of the queries that have been shared. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you very much for, for that presentation uh, so far, Jeanette. So we, we do have a few uh, questions already in the Q&A. Uh, before we before we get into that, um, I'd like to just ask everybody uh, if uh, to to go ahead and answer this question, just to get a sense of, of where people are at. So uh, please go ahead and uh, and click the, this. Uh, everybody on the call, if you have had any exposure to interview based or qualitative talent intelligence research, and that'll will get people to do that as as they're gathering their questions as well. <clears throat> All right, so we'll just give a few more seconds for people to finish uh, answering. I think I'll start to respond to this now, Gordon. I think we're seeing that about 40, 46% have had um, have had some exposure there and 54 percent yep. have them. And that's really Basically interesting. A 50 50. yeah yeah that's really really interesting um that actually probably surprises me either uh slightly um but i think what it actually illustrates for me is a point that someone made to me recently is that talent intelligence can come in different guises uh, and actually um i probably shouldn't be surprised because i even said myself at the beginning um is that executive research um, it, it is something that's been around for, for absolutely ages. 
Um, and, and that's where this term talent intelligence comes from. And I think a recent development is probably a firming up of, of, the, of the vocabulary when it comes to, you know, when, because the very large businesses are talking about it and talking about it a little bit more in Europe. Um, but yes, it's always been around. So yes, I'm, it, it, it's interesting to see. All right. So let's jump into the questions then. So um, the first question that's come in from, uh, from Jay, good to have you on the call today, Jay. Um, what is the difference uh, from uh, talent intelligence to HR analytics? As a, as a really good, so that's a really good point there. Um, HR and analytics can certainly take the place of talent intelligence if talent intelligence is not needed. If, if, if analytics just gives you the answers you need, then, then use analytics. Analytics is obviously, it's more on the, on, on the data side. Um, I personally haven't been, I haven't been knee deep in, 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 in people or, or an, in people analytics. I'm, you know, I'm aware of some sources and I've looked at some sources. Um, but it, it is a more on the data side. Um, uh, it can, and obviously it can be internal or external. Uh, people analytics is, is often internal because I'm thinking about the, the larger businesses. Um, who, who have access to that. But the big difference I would say with talent intelligence is that talent intelligence, um, it, you know, it, you, you, you would use talent intelligence if, if, you're, if the analytics you have isn't giving you the answer or if you might even be wanting to check up on it. Talent intelligence is something that would normally bring together multiple data sources. So not just the analytics, but, pro, you know, but, but the interviews, for example, um, press, um, um, you may be other scrape, other scrape sources than than what you than than what or, or other alternatives, and it it and um, it it would put them into a structure where you know you have a stage process, and at the end you have some quite robust conclusions. Um, you have um, multiple. You know, a, a report. You know, um, with, with you know, with with, with multiple, um, you know, graphs and slides um, that you can communicate back to the to, to the business. And it's it's just, in my view, talent intelligence is offering you something kind of bigger and heavier. Um, not necessarily very heavy, um, but um, it, it goes into much more detail, basically. But you don't need talent intelligence if your analytics is giving you the answer that you need and you you have um quite a lot of faith in that that answer all right so let's let's move on to the uh kind of related question which is then what's the difference between sourcing and talent intelligence sourcing again it's actually really similar um a similar answer to before um so my view sourcing is um when you well, I say sourcing probably would happen when you already know certain things. If you already know what role you're sourcing for, um, you you know the job title, you know the you've got a broad view of the job description, um, you know which sector you're going to be be, be looking at, you know what level in the hierarchy. Um, you would do with all the if you have all that information, you would start your sourcing in my view. Mm. I, I think also you illustrated it really well, Jeanette, with your timeline about, yeah, about exactly. now, near future, and then, and then long term. I think that's a good way of, of framing it as well. Yeah. Um, but if you don't know the answers to those questions, you're starting to get into a position where you need talent intelligence. However, I would add that there can be some, there can be some crossover because, of course, a trigger for talent intelligence is experimentation. So in the course of that study, you might have sourcing conversations with a hypothetical job title at the back of your mind or a couple of, a couple of them, um, a hypothetical set that you might look at. So you would be on a call with um, a decision maker and saying, well, my, my, my client might be, you know, my, my client is considering this type of role um, and they would have this type of responsibilities. You know, how, you know, how, you know, have you heard about that in, in, in your sector? Um, is that something you're familiar with? Who is particularly strong at doing that kind of thing? And then you might put the phone down and then go to someone else and then go uh, who, who's from a different sector and say, well, my, you know, as, 
in, this is another role that not another but you would you would you know you'd point to a maybe a slightly different version of the role um, you wouldn't be telling that person well this is the plan b but um you would be you know you would you you would certainly use sourcing conversations as part of a, 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 as part of a, a talent intelligence uh, activity and probably as an output uh, you might have um, a, num a list of names um, of people of, of, of people who are doing, you know, you'll have a group of people who are doing customer experience and then you've got um, a group of people who are doing um, uh, digital marketing. So, and very, very, you know, people, who, so there might actually be a lot of crossover in those roles, but there's two different versions of it. But through the sourcing, you're exploring each one. Um, but the you know but the output is not to start the recruitment straight away but to go back to your client and say these are the paths that you could that, that you could go down so yeah you would you, you know you might use sourcing as a tool within your talent intelligence but the kind of sourcing for real in inverted commas that's when you you know you absolutely know exactly what you're looking for sure sure absolutely i think that's a pretty comprehensive answer uh, and so a question from stan how do business leaders respond to talent intelligence reports good good question in a variety of ways <laughs> <laughs> um, so um so thinking about somebody a business leader responding who is being ultra professional like i'll, I'll do almost certain impressions here of certain people um, they would really appreciate that um uh, the, the the how robust um, the, the research is and um, they appreciate that they know that when they come to the point where they rate recruitment when they start to recruit they know which areas to go in they're appreciative of that um, sometimes to be honest I don't know exactly how they're responding because it is HR taking ownership of that um, of that study um, and, and I get the and I, and I kind of find out from HR what what, what the response is um, now sometimes um they you know what we're telling the business leaders is what they already know or suspect um and that's all that's that's okay actually because they at least now have um some evidence to back up what they're thinking they're going to be making decisions based on um kind of, kind of some solid data in the market as opposed to just their feelings and what they've picked up from gossip um they it's supposed to be, be a bit of a throwaway comment there but but you know they're, they're acting on something solid rather than just their feelings now other other responses now if you think a bit more informal um i i i must admit there was there was actually a hr leader who did say to me that he that his business leaders absolutely loved the fact that i had spoken with a number of the competitors um and and um and got them interested in this client and they love the disruptive element of it. They, 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 they were a bit, you know, they were typical sales guys. They were quite mischievous um, and they, they appreciated their report, but they loved the mischievous element to it. They loved it that they got all this data on their competitors and they, they were making all these, these good sales guys turn their heads. So that's, that's another reaction. Um, a second, uh, give another example. I've had, um, a response again this is through hr but but still it was a response of the business it was communicated back to me and um, they, they ended up finding out through the talent intelligence that uh, when when people were asked about perceptions they in a very very specific area they found out that some of their staff members weren't seen as very good performers um, they were actually seen as a bit rubbish to be blunt but these um <laughs> these individuals the, these were in i think software very senior people in software development um, they were hidden away to the wider enterprise because obviously very you know these companies are vast um and and they um what we just picked up it was a gossipy thing it was it was a secondary it was a secondary anecdote but they really appreciated finding out how their staff members were were, were not um uh were, were, were not rated and, and the reasons why so a fair range of, of responses essentially. Oh absolutely from from the ultra professional to thank you very much this is going to help um, our decision making this is we know we have a plan now we have a more robust plan we'll dovetail this with our strategy to oh oh I love all this gossip uh, please tell us more so it, it ranges from from that to that. So another question here how do you report on the soft data meaning the soft data mm -hmm. from conversations with external talents? This is an, this is an excellent question. Um, 
so I've, I've mentioned the graphs and the charts, um, but what we do, uh, say if we, say if there were some, say if we had a, a graph where somebody mentioned something that nobody else mentioned, but was very interesting, um, we would detail that. And if, if, we, if we thought it would be interesting to the client, um, and, and because on the call, and this is why you would have a headhunter doing this, is why, or, or somebody very, very skilled, is because that, that person would have the knowledge to spot someone talking about something anomalous um, and, and investigate it. Um, and we, so we might have, for example, you know, um, in the last report I did, I, I did a, a competitor in focus box um, and, and took some of the data, took some of the, the interesting things that were being said um, about competitors, because some it was a very, very dynamic sector um, where there was a lot of experimentation taking place. So some people were talking about things that, that, that others weren't. Um, so, the, you know, a fat box, for instance. Also, what we do do is um, put direct quotes in. Um, and, 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 you know, you have the direct voice of, of people talking about certain things um, that could be of interest to the client. Uh, but, but as mentioned, of course, when we, when we hear something that, that is not fitting in with everything else, but is really quite interesting. We, we, we will interrogate that. Well, not interrogate, but we will we, we will explore that further in in, in, a, in a gentle way that that that's appropriate. And that this is where we're getting. This is where talent intelligence is different from the analytics and the data and the secondary data, because we can find out about anom anomalies, understand them, and and contextualize them. Okay. And, and a kind of follow on question uh, related to that is, do you find that men and women are equally open to share this kind of information? This is that this, this is a great question as well. I think I find that hard to answer without kind of going into, you know, starting to be very unscientific, because first of all, we're talking in a leadership, we're often talking about leadership um, levels in the hierarchy. So it, it's male dominated anyway. And so the sample size of women is, is immediately really quite small and then even smaller still as you get into technology. Um, but I have actually done studies where it, it has been a hundred percent women because a trigger, and this is what I really should have mentioned, a trigger for talent intelligence is diversity and inclusion. Um, okay. a, a diver, a, you know, a desire to, uh, bring underrepresented groups into a business and that might not be race or gender that might be um, um, that might be you know a certain a professional type group or how can I put professional this? background like a yeah professional, certain professional background so people you know so people in in marketing who who have done analytics for instance sure um, yeah so, so um, but, but I mean broadly speaking I kind of want to say that men might be a little bit more open um, but I, I really can't because women have been very, very cooperative as, uh, uh, as well. It's just that they're simply, there are, there are more men out there. So it, it, you do end up with a feeling that men, men are more open, but that's a very sci unscientific response. Okay. So perhaps I think we have, uh, just time for one last question, which is a very a good, uh, one to be our last question, which is what are some of the KPI recommendations or success measurements of success for talent intelligence? This is, the, 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 you know, this is this next generation. Um, and this is why at the beginning of my presentation, there was an Archaeopteryx and, and then there's a hummingbird because it's, it's changing and we're not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say in, from what I know, we're not at that level of maturity um, in this approach. Um, so I've been speaking with a leader, a talent intelligence leader, and the plan is she's she's just joined her business um so some talent intelligence has been taking place for about 18 months but she thinks she is another 18 months away from having meaningful kpis i think there'll be interim kpis uh, but meaningful kpis are a bit of a way away um i think so i think what i would have in mind what i have seen of, of people using as measures of I've seen, and, and of course, you know, you, it's, it's not easy to collate. What, what I'm going to give examples of, it's not easy to, it's not easy to do. And it depends, you know, how, you know, how, 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 you know, how capable you are of collating this data, how much time you want to spend on it. But I have seen 
leaders in talent intelligence talk about say things like we have influ we have um uh we have um uh we have influenced um five million five million euros worth of decision of, of decisions um things like cost per hire and uh, quality per hire that's still quite anecdotal it, it, ca it can be a challenge to measure um so i'm, I'm sorry I, I can't give a full answer to that but that's because this is um a, a fast a, a, um, a transitioning um area of talent acquisition i think what you highlight there at the internet is that it, it is fast uh, fastly developing it is emerging and it is it, the, essentially, the, the main value is that it's applied in a slightly different uh, way, case by case, depending mm -hmm. on needs and depending on sectors. So, I think that's that's perhaps one of the one of the main the main takeaways. Mm -hmm. um, we are pretty much out of time now. Uh, thank you for all your questions. Uh, we will follow up uh, with with the remaining questions as well uh, directly uh, to you. And uh, we have recorded this session. So uh, we'll also be sharing that uh, with you as well for later use. If you do have any further questions that you'd like to ask offline, do uh, feel free to reach out to, uh, to us directly. Um, you can find, if you're not really connected with me on LinkedIn, uh, that, that way. Also my contact details are of course on our, on our website as well. Thank you uh, to everyone uh, for joining the call, uh, whether you are on this side of the world in sunny, sunny Seoul with blue skies, uh, or over in the UK as well, uh, just starting the day. Last of all, thank you uh, so much to Jeanette for, for presenting a very insightful presentation today. And uh, uh, hope that uh, there will be some more uh, you know, interesting outputs and, and questions uh, coming out uh, from the discussions that we've had today. Thank you and see you again next time. Thank you, bye-bye.